Okay, can you guys see it? So here we have Lakshmi. I'll show you the title page, hold on. So this is Lakshmi, this is the cover of the book. Um, in COVID times, I unfortunately have not gotten a print ARC copy, but I'm still gonna share with you guys. So here we go. Hi, I'm Lakshmi, come here, closer. You see that? That's my much. What's a much, you ask? These little hairs above my lip. It's okay, you can look. Oops. I never really thought about my much until the other day when my friends and I were playing farm animals at recess. Zoe was a horse, Noah was a cow, and Zoe said, Lakshmi, you're a cat, okay? I wanna be a chicken, I said. But you're the perfect cat. You have these little hairs on your lip, like cat whiskers, said Zoe. I do, I asked. Meow, said Noah. Yeah, you have a little mustache like my dad. My cheeks grew as hot as a steaming bowl of mummy's alu gobi. I went to the bathroom after recess and looked in the mirror. Zoe was right. I did look like a cat with small black whiskers. I sat at my desk with my hand over my mouth so no one could see my much. Everywhere I walked, I thought I heard kids whisper, meow. The whole day, I kept noticing hair all over my body, on my arms and knuckles and legs, even in the space between my eyebrows. I'll read one more page. When I got home that afternoon, mommy asked, how was school, beta? Well, Zoe said I'd make a good cat, I said. Aw, you're my little Billy, she said. No, mommy, she was calling me Harry. Huh, I thought we named you Lakshmi, said Papa, <laughs> looking up from the roti he was making on the stove. Okay, so there's a little hint of, um, or a little blurb of, of Lakshmi. You'll have, to, you'll have to read the rest when it comes out. Um, and I ended on a dad joke there that was very <laughs> reminiscent of something my my dad would say and something my husband would say to my kids. I'm Shelly Anand. Um, this is my debut picture book. Um, I've had the pleasure of, you know, being new to the, the kidlet um, world and the Desi kidlet world. And there have there are just so many wonderful, wonderful people here. Um, and the three individuals I'm about to introduce to you have become um, you know, close friends of mine, um, people that I can get advice from as I, you know, get ready for my debut book coming out, and people that I really admire their work and their books. I have a copy of all of their books um, in our in our library, and um, some of the some of my top recommendations if you're looking to expand your your children's uh, library. So I'm first going to introduce uh, Simran um, Simran Jeet Singh. Uh, Simran loves sports and signed up for his first marathon after being inspired by Foja Singh. And like Foja, he hasn't stopped running since. Simran is an activist, writer, and scholar who believes deeply in the divine goodness of all people. He was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and now lives in New York City with his wife and two daughters. Um, and then we have uh, Vashti Harrison. Uh, Vashti is a New York Times bestseller, author, illustrator, originally from only Virginia. She has a background in cinema cinematography and screenwriting and a love of storytelling. She got her F MFA from um, Cal Arts, where she rekindled a love for drawing and painting. Now util utilizing both skill sets, she's passionate about crafting beautiful stories for children and young adults in the kidlit world. She is the author and illustrator of the best-selling middle grade series, Little Leaders, Little Dreamers, Little Legends, and the illustrator of the best-selling picture books, Hair Love by Matthew Cherry, Sulway by Lupita Nyong'o, which received a Coretta Scott King Illustrator Award. And she's also a two-time recipient of the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work for Children. Um, you can find her at VashtiHarrison.com or in, on Instagram at VashtiHarrison. Um, and then last but not least, we have Saida Mir, who's a physician and author of the award-winning picture book, Muslim Girls Rise. This biographic anthology was born out of the need to counter Islamophobia 
and fill her daughter, daughter's heart with amazing Muslim women just like her. Saida loves teaching in the hospital and classroom. She's a newbie homeschooler and learned you have to hide the permanent markers. You can follow news of her upcoming books at SaidaMir.com and on social media at SaidaMirBooks. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming here today and taking um, time out of your pandemic hectic schedules to, to talk about uh, kid lit, all things KidLit and Daisy KidLit. Um, I want to start by asking why for you um, was it important to write um, your book, your books now, and what political or social context were you responding to? Um, and whoever wants to start can. Yeah, I can, I can jump in because that's a really easy answer for me. Um, I started writing this during the 2016 election cycle. Um, there were all these sound bites on TV. And one that struck me um, really viscerally was Islam hates us. And um, my daughter was four at the time, so I was able to shield her from a lot of this, you know, hateful rhetoric um, that is going to follow us through the rest of our lives, unfortunately. Um, but I really wanted to counter that with love and, and with positivity. So I just started sharing stories about women that inspired me. And as a child, she was so excited about our bedtime stories that it was just a natural like progression to go from, you know, talking about these women to like, you know, these, everyone should know about these women. They're really exciting and wonderful and inspiring. So um, I just started writing at that point. Simran, do you want to go? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that. I mean, right on point for me. It's, it's an issue of countering, um, countering narratives and providing a counter narrative in a context where there's uh, so many negative stereotypes that we're dealing with every day. So I think, I think that was um, an initial impulse for me. But I guess you know, one of the one of the really particular things about this story. Um, the way that it came up for me is, you know, I was, I was sitting with Fouja Singh uh, in a living room and, and just listening to him talk about his life. Uh, we spent about two hours just reflecting and, you know, I'd seen so much of myself in him for so many years before we met and, and I still did, but there was also so much in his life that was experiences that I'd never have and would never have. And sitting there and listening to him, I, I, I was finding myself asking questions about my own assumptions, right? Like, so, the, the one that, I mean, these are sort of embarrassing to admit now, but, but one of them is, you know, he had ability as a child, so he never got to go to school and he never learned to read or write. And in my head, I've always had this bias that I've never really questioned of, you know, the people who deserve our admiration are literate, right? Like those are, those are the smart people in our world. And all of a sudden I was faced with the reality that one of my heroes doesn't read or write and I had to reconcile that in my head so it was I mean there's so many things about his story that really helped me uh, connect with difference and, and be more intersectional and, and that when, when I realized that that's when I was like this is this is the story I want to share with my kids amazing what about you Vashti um, well, I came to Kidlet through art and illustration. So I think a lot of what was driving me in the choices for the books that I worked on and the books that I've written was really about representation and in its most physical form in making sure that every type of kid gets to see themselves in these pictures. The first book I illustrated was Festival of Colors about Holy the Indian Festival of Colors and, and Spring and New Beginnings. And in the text, um, they talked about all of the people from the neighborhood that were coming over to play. And I wanted to make sure every type of person who gets to celebrate Holy or will get to celebrate Holy can see themselves here on these pages. And that really kind of kickstarted my love for um, for making books and making sure I'm putting in all of those little details that kids can spend time pouring over and say, that looks like me, that's me. And I tried to bring that into the books that I've written, um, Little Leaders. My first book is about African-American women. Um, I myself am biracial, my father's African-American, my mother is West Indian, born in the Caribbean. And so my second book, I really wanted to focus on 
um, the other ways that I know I exist in this world and the way I see, I see myself and the way, um, the way I, I feel like I function in this world. And so my second book is really about creativity, about visionary women around the world. And I wanted to make sure, one, I really focus on um, the stories of women from as many different places as possible and showcase as many diverse versions of what creativity looks like. So it's filled with stories of women, artists, and scientists. Something hopefully for every kid to, to flip through and find someone that looks like them. You know, I draw my characters in a really simple kind of way to kind of hopefully make sure, you know, any kid could see a little bit of themselves in each one, but say, oh, I love, I love the way the, that shirt sparkles, or I love the way um, that hair is combed or, or dressed up, or, you know, I, I want to make sure that the kids who maybe were a little bit like me, who didn't necessarily love um, history, had a reason to want to open up these books and learn about other worlds and other cultures and see themselves. Amazing. I remember I met Simran and Vashti at um, the launch of, of Kokilas in, in New York. And I remember meeting your dad, Vashti, and he was <laughs> like, have you read um, her Festival of Color book, like her celebrating her Indian heritage? Um, and one of the things, I mean, it's one of my kids' favorite books, like Uma literally is always like, holy hey, holy hey, like whenever um, she sees the book. And I really loved the spectrum of representation that's in that book, because whenever holy comes around, you see what the South Asian diaspora looks like. Um, and it's all over. It's in, you know, obviously the, the you know, Indian subcontinent, the, the subcontinent, South Asian subcontinent but also in you know, East Africa, in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, and also just the spectrum of what they see South Asian folks look like. Right. And we don't get that representation. And um, you know, I think a lot of times we see even an Indian kidlet in, from, from the subcontinent, um, very light-skinned folks, that's not at all representative of like even our own families, like there's a spectrum of skin color in our own. Yeah, family. when I get together with all of my mom's family, we all look different. So I wanted to make sure that that kind of, that beauty is represented on the page because it's all our culture, we're all related. So I wanted to make sure everyone got to see someone that looks like them. Yeah, and that your first, um, a child's introduction to a runner or an astronaut isn't just another like white American person, but like for my kids, it's like Fauja Singh and Flojo. Like those are the two runners that they have quick access to because of your books. Um, and when I know Narayan, my son um, Simran had a, an event at a local bookshop here and he was like, oh, this guy's a hundred years old and he can run. Um, I, do I run as fast as him? Like just, um, and the context of like a fast runner for him is like a hundred year old Sikh man. Like that is just so amazing. Um, you know, for me, like literally the inspiration for Lakshmi was a little, you know, brown girl in my community getting bullied and me um, for her mustache and me instantly connecting with that feeling because I went through it so much in my, in my childhood. Um, and I was on maternity leave with my daughter and I looked down at her and she has a little much and I'm like, oh God, like I really don't want her to go through everything I went through. I don't want her to have to go to the beauty parlor, you know, in seventh grade and just start this trajectory of hair, painful hair removal for the rest of her life. Um, and so it's about normalizing body hair and it's about normalizing that women have mustaches and that's okay and they're kind of cool um and you know just kind of us embracing how we're born and what we look like and not conforming to what we think girls and women should look like or boys for that matter i mean something that's been surprising for me with um the news of lakshmi coming out is how much it's resonated with people people saying i wish this book had come out when i was a kid but it also resonating with south asian men I had a friend um, who's Kashmiri and Pakistani, and he was saying that as a kid, he was made to bleach his mustache as a preteen because his parents thought he was too hairy and, you know, clean up his sideburns and 
all of the stuff. So just kind of being children of immigrants and not conforming to like what an American kid in school should look like and kind of everything we went through. Um, for me, it's like paving a path so my kids don't have to do that, kind of giving them the tools they need to kind of navigate some of the challenges we face as, as non-white kids, you know, in, in the world um, and, in, and in the States. Um, and that kind of brings me to one of, one of my next, one of the topics we've talked about is how do we navigate, um, you know, wanting to write about like kind of, you know, troubling stuff, lack of representation, Islamophobia, people saying really hurtful things to you, bullying, um, having to educate people about what Sikhism is, what Sikh people look like and what the religion is. Um, and, you know, being, being a black woman, a biracial black woman, you know, in a country where black women are made to do all the work and not given the recognition they deserve. Um, how, do we, how do we balance that need in kid lit for creating this path for our kids to, to not have to suffer like we did and, and writing about some of the pain with kind of the creative, normal, trick-or-treating, you know, American childhood that we want for, for diverse children. Yeah, I, I think about this a lot um, because I think me or all of us growing up here is gonna be a very different experience in the next generation, which is good. They're gonna have these books that we're all creating, right? We didn't have any of this growing up. So I, I think a lot about my childhood experiences and what I went through and what I struggled through and I have to kind of remember that um, kids don't want to be preached they don't want to be taught they want to be entertained so for me it's really about kind of tying in these moments of questioning individuality questioning my identity um, made to feel othered uh, to have a bigger picture to the story too right like the the hope the sense of community, the healing, right? It doesn't happen in a 36-page a layout of my life. It happened over 30 years, but, you know, it, to, to kind of convey those small messages of like, yes, bad things happen. People are going to question how you look or the hair on your lip or how you pray, how you dress, you know, the color of your skin, all of those things. Um, but the small little nugget that I took from my life experience, you tie it into your characters. And I think that's the part that I really hold on to, um, the most out of these stories that that that's the part that needs to be told more so than the 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 trauma if that makes sense absolutely i think one of the the things that i worry about in creating this work is is i often fear um giving power to some of these things that <laughs> you know, I don't want to repeat and I don't want a generation, um, the next generation having to deal with. And so I think that is a constant um, kind of balance. I'm trying to figure out my work is kind of either, you know, really focusing in on some of these difficult topics and seeing ways to empower kids or offering ways to empower kids to overcome them or ignoring it entirely. Do I want them to have to deal with it? And I know that's a question lots of parents are asking and, and, and are concerned about, like maybe my kids ready to read the story. Maybe my kid isn't ready to talk about these things. But I think if we've learned anything from the year 2020, it's that many of the things that we thought this country had moved past are st is still very present. And so sadly, like that, these, these realities, these harsh truths may still always be there. And so I do want to create kind of a roadmap or a blueprint or a way that young people can talk about these things if they need to. Um, and I don't necessarily want to center um, really difficult topics as the only way, but I want them to be available right next to these stories of kids going on adventures and like losing a tooth. You know, I think that it should all be there. And that's what I'm hoping for in, as we make changes in this industry is to offer more kind of lateral diversity instead of just singular diversity. Like, oh, here's another issue book featuring a brown kid, but <laughs> let's put that right next to some other boring banal book because sometimes we need those too. I, I like your conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that point. And I'll, I'll just say um, yes, yes to all of that. I, 
a hundred percent feel feel that it's i mean there's a certain tension to it at least when i first started writing of how do we um bring about beautiful stories that our kids will love and also instill these messages and it's a it's a tough balance to strike um and so i think i think where i landed and, and what i hope to do more of um is to try and do it in a way where where you you tell the beautiful story and then you uh, give little entry points or on ramps to different kinds of conversations. And so, you know, I have a four year old and a two year old at home, and the way that my four year old reads or understands the story now is very different than she did last year mm -hmm. when she first saw it. And the questions she's asking are very different, right? Like last last month, she asked me, she had never asked me this before, but she said, "Well, why didn't he get to go to school? That doesn't seem." very fair and so we had a our first conversation around ableism which wouldn't have happened um if if there wasn't some intention behind the way that we tell those stories so i mean to me there's there's a real balance a, a real grace required in terms of telling a compelling story but being intentional about giving our kids those on ramps and i think that's that's what i try and do in my parenting too right like i'm not forcing my kids or lecturing my kids to to discuss certain topics um, but I do want to expose them to different ideas and cultures and concepts so that when they're ready, they can ask those questions. So I, I think that's, that's been my best answer so far. I want to piggyback one little point. This yeah. is back from South Asians in general, but one of my pet peeves when people ask, oh, what is the age group for this book? I'm like, it's for everybody. You know, their kid lit is so beautiful because it's so layered, right? Characters, settings, events, images the t one sentence can spurn like an entire rabbit hole, right? Of like learning stuff. So I think when someone said, yeah, when you come back to this book later, kids get more out of it, adults get more out of it. And I just think that's the challenge and the beauty of writing like picture books in particular. Um, so books are for everybody. When you have an age limit, it just, it kind of drives me a little crazy. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I think kid lit has become my favorite genre. One, mm -hmm. because the diversity that we're all seeking in literature exists most pronouncedly in, in Kidlet. Um, that's where you're seeing brown and black indigenous, you know, Asian faces and stories um, and learning about um, different cultures and different ways of thinking, um, but also it being like, you know, a story about a child kind of navigating, navigating things. And I think, um, you know, one thing that's always interest or that was interesting to me was when I was first pitching the book to publishers, um, you know, kind of what we're dealing with, not just as authors, but as, you know, what the publishing industry as a whole. So like when I first wrote a draft of Lakshmi, it was less playful. So you see this scene where they're playing a game, they're playing farm animals, and that's how it comes up. Like my experience was very different. I was older when I got teased for my much. I was like in fifth grade in science class. I remember the names of the boys. I'm not going to shame them here, but shame on you um, <laughs> for, for what you did to me. Right, your <laughs> next book, right? I know. Um, but I remember um, my agent submitted it out and there were like two kind of schools of response. School number one, like thought number one was like, this is too much bullying for a child. Like children don't go through this. And then the other one was that the child was too self-conscious for her age. And so I asked my agent, I was like, okay, do the people say, the people who said it's too much bullying, are they people of color? Do they have children of color? Right. She, no, they're all white. And then for the people that said she's too self-conscious for their age, I'm like, do they have children that are this age in this, you know, right now? Because yeah, I agree. I never thought six-year-olds would have to worry about body hair, weight, all of the things we de dealt with as, as tweens and teens, but that's all happening now. Um, so I wanted, that's kind of what my, what my experience was, kind of bringing Lakshmi into the, into the kid-lit publishing world, and I ended up kind of combining um, two different versions of the story, making it less on the nose about the bullying and a little bit more playful. Um, and I really, I'm happy with the result, but it was just kind of interesting to see the POC 
um, folks in the industry didn't have kids and then the white folks had no idea what we went through. Um, what was your experience in kind of bringing your stories and kind of navigating the publishing world? I, I had a wonderful experience um, and I'm, I'm happy to share like a positive one. Um, and I think it speaks to the fact that the world is ready for these stories. Not everyone believes in them, but the people who need to read them, like they, there's, there's power to the push. So, um, you know, as I was writing my story, I started querying agents um, and got, got a ton of, oh, we don't really connect with this, but good luck, you know, which is a, a response. So, which was like, okay, I can need to keep going. And then I connected to my agent who also happens to be South Asian, also happens to be Muslim, and she just championed it. And I feel like you just need that one person who really believes in what you're saying and, and understands the power of, of you know, a, a missing narrative um, and, and is able to you know, bring it to life. Um, subsequently, you know, there have been other works where people just didn't connect, they didn't understand. And, and I think we are all positioned to um, unfortunately be used to that. Um, so I think we're all very tenacious and resilient in that aspect that, you know, we know these stories need to be heard. So we'll, we'll continue pushing. I think in the past four to five years, there's been a huge conversation. I mean, we're having this panel now, uh, about kid lit and, and our stories. And I think that's, that's just kind of setting, you know, uh, a field where we're going to be seeing a lot more, you know, South Asian stories, which is exciting. Yeah, I also feel very fortunate that I had a very um, smooth entrance into the publishing world. Um, my my book series sold really well, and it sold at auction, and and many people were excited for it and felt it felt like, oh yeah, we need this book. <laughs> We've needed this book a long time ago. Um, but I I believe that's like nearly 100% a result of many people in the industry working hard um, for, from, from the, the groups like We Need Diverse Books and kind of the, the movement for own voices. So that is people of color telling their own stories. And I think like without those people really putting in the hard work over the past 10, 15, 20 years, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't be here and I'm so grateful for it. And I think um, as much as like, we've seen the hard work get done and we're all here now, there is still definitely a long way to go. I mean, some of the conversations that people are still having are that, you know, black girls don't read books like that or brown, no one's going to buy a book filled with, you know, 50 brown girls. Like clearly the market, there are people in the market that are hungry for this and we need to be able to tell these stories. So I, I definitely think that there needs to be a consistent push on people in the publishing industry to make space for, for books like this. And, and sadly that often comes down to like money and how much money they're putting behind a book. Do, is this considered a lead title? So will you get a publicist and will you have that direct connection with your publicist and are they actively fighting for you to get events to get you know your book on on some tv show like it's a it's a grind honestly and and pe there are people that are really good at it and um you know god bless the people that are like you know working super hard to make sure that these stories get seen and told um but i do i wouldn't want to let up the gas on the publishing industry to make sure that you know they're still putting in the effort because, you know, clearly we haven't, we haven't solved racism. So there are many other um, reasons and arguments to make sure that, you know, we're putting the right attention behind these books. Like, I, you know, a thing that I'm, I feel like I'm consistently dealing with is worrying that my books are getting kind of um, still kind of pigeonholed, kind of, you know, categorized in this section of the bookstore and not in this section of the bookstore, or, you know, they're brought out and at the, like the beginning of Black History Month and the beginning of Women's History Month, and then they go away. Like, um, you know, I get it. I get that this is a business and we have to be able to, you know, sell books, yeah. you know, the best way possible. But, you know, it's often the books of, of, people of color that off, that get categorized as specialty books and not as like regular books. And so that is a big question. Like that's an inherent question that I think the publishing industry still needs to um, address. And, and, you know, that's a result of the industry um, being, you know, dominated by like very well-meaning, very smart, but, you know, 
predominantly white women who haven't, you know, who haven't internally, you know, addressed their, their own personal biases or, you know, their, or just the fact that they haven't examined these things before. Um, so again, a question like, um, that you brought up Shelly about, you know, is this, is this bullying too much? You know, I, I hear, you know, some parents say, you know, that they, that they don't want to, they don't want to introduce their kid to racism. Um, and, and some of the things that are in, in, that are kind of inherent in the stories that I write about. And it's like, you know, some kids don't have that choice. And so those, um, those kinds of um, feelings towards something like racism or, or prejudice, it gets to be separated and it gets to be otherized in, from the white gaze and from the white perspective. And often that's what's dominating the publishing industry. And so that's how, when you go to Amazon, you look at like a Vashti Harrison book, it's categorized under racism, <laughs> racism and issue books and not like just children's books. Yeah, or like women I mean, in STEM or women right. in art. Right. Yeah, it, it's, it's there too, but like, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm really proud of the hard work that's being done, but I, I wouldn't want to like congratulate everyone just yet because we've got a long way to go. Yeah, I think there's definitely key players that are helping things move along, but it's definitely not the entire system for sure. Um, just a real quick point I don't want to take up, uh, monopolize too much time, but um, there is a push but there is a little space for each topic that we want to tell, right? Like, so I was so excited about a story, like so passionate about it. And then I see a announcement of the similar children's book and immediately I'm kind of like, Oh, but you know, my story's different. Right, right. And they're like, well, it's the same topic. So sorry. You know, like, no, like people, like I saw so many announcements of the same animal book coming out the same month, you know, the same season. And I'm like, if I see another owl book, for a year from now, I'm going to lose my, you know, and I don't want to feel like that. Like I need space there too. If it's a well-written story that's passionate, that's based on real life experiences um, that I know people will be, you know, excited to hear. It's, it's really kind of fighting that and feeling a little voiceless in that aspect that I, I think is the biggest struggle is like, yeah, on one side, things have been nice and smooth, but unless you're the first person in line to get there with the idea, you know, you just scrap it and have to think about something else, which, you know, what, why do you do that, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what's, I mean, it's, it's kind of replicated in real life, right? Like where pe people of color in our professions and in our communities, we want to be the best and we have to show that we are the first X, the first Y. We want to be the first ones to, you know, have written a book about body hair or whatever. And like, how come there can't be you know, 50 books about women and their body hair when there are women yeah. across the world and, and, and men's body hair, right? There are people across the world that are dealing with this issue in different cultures and different contexts. There can't, there can't just be one book about it. Um, and that kind of brings me to another topic, which is about who do we write these books for and writing for the white gaze versus um, writing as we would write. And this came up for me a, a good bit because there's a, there's a, there's Hindi and Urdu in my book. And we did end up doing, um, end papers that kind of gave a, a explanation or a definition of the book. Um, but you know, within the, the text itself, I don't make any effort to translate, you know, some of the, the phrases, much, um, gobialu, mom saying Tokyo when she comes home. Um, and, you know, there were, and there were very like specific things that I put in the book that maybe to um, someone who hasn't studied the subcontinent wouldn't really think about, but we had like a whole discussion about um, at, for the end paper, like whether to include, to just contextualize the language as Hindi versus Hindi and Urdu and put, including not just Devangri script, but, you know, Urdu script as well. And we, I decided, you know, Nubby and I decided we wanted it to be both because the language is so politicized, right? And my, you know, I'm the granddaughter of refugees from partition. Um, all my family is, my ancestors are from, you know, all these cities in present day Pakistan and everyone spoke Urdu and wrote Urdu. And it, it was just like, and Farsi and Pashto, like they knew these languages and they were their languages regardless of, religion and um that was one of my favorite things it was like a very nuanced small 
topic, but we had this whole discussion about it. Like, should we include it? Does it feel forced? Is this authentic? Um, and that was totally something that's so specific to the South Asian audience. And unless you're like a South Asian studies scholar, you're probably like, whatever. <laughs> But it was really important to me. And that was one of the things I loved about Foja Singh. Foja Singh, he like writes his name in Urdu. Like that's what my grandfather used to read the Urdu newspaper. And he would, he was from um, Sialkot and he would like read the news about what was happening in Sialkot still. He still had friends there. Um, and so it was a little bit of like healing for me. I mean, even seeing the image that um in Foja Singh of like pre-partition Punjab like I had little tears running down I mean she's like really subtle beautiful things that aren't there it's for us it's not for anyone else um did you guys go through that experience at all when you were working on your books kind of being like whatever white gaze this isn't for you <laughs> Well, I personally haven't had to, I haven't had that opportunity or that experience yet, but one thing I really like about it is that it really places you, the reader, in the world of that protagonist. Like, that feels very much similar to my experience as a first-generation American. Like, my mom uses words that I don't know the definition of, but I, like, I know how they sound, and I know that they're coming from this Indian diaspora that she grew up with, but she doesn't know the meaning of these words. And I, I appreciate that, like, you, the reader, are, are trying to kind of um, examine a culture that you are not super familiar with, but also, like, that is 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 Lakshmi like a um, a specialist in Urdu? Like she's not either, so we don't have to be. So we're here to identify with her, and we're experiencing the world the way she is. So I think like that's perfectly acceptable for young readers because like we wouldn't expect the protagonist to know everything. Absolutely. Um, when I write, so when I write, I like to write a lot about my, you know, childhood experiences, at least in the stories I've been doing lately. Just naturally, I tend to present myself um, under the white gaze, right? So when I'm writing, I, I know it's for a larger audience. It's not my home identity. It's my outside identity. And so I really have to consciously go back several times and think like, is this really how I would tell my story to my own inner circle, um, my intended readers, but also um making it um humanistic enough that it's it's um you know a, a personal story for everybody so for me it's a challenge like this is a really tough topic for me i know people have a lot of advice that i find myself having to to make revisions a lot because it's something i'm consciously unlearning as an adult um and it's like part of the decolonizing right yeah. push um so i i appreciate that this conversation is happening because i i'm starting to unlearn myself yeah, I appreciate that last point, especially because there are, there are certain parts of my book that I'm like, oh my God, I hate that now. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I no. Mean, something I thought whenever, I mean, there, I'm, so the, the book itself went through several iterations, right? So it's, it's very different than when I first drafted it, but its final version, which is what's published now, there, there are certain things in there which are like, man, I, 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 I can't believe I thought that way two years ago. I, of course I can believe it, but I... I wish I could just change it because I've learned a few things ever since, right? And so um, that's that's a really interesting part of the question of like, who's your audience? Because I mean, I think for creatives, a lot of times you are your worst critic. Um, and so you are part of part of your own audience. And, and that speaks to what you were saying, Shelley, that like some of this, it's so personal, um, right? Like you, in, in a space where you are one of the few you want to do, um, even though it's not my goal, I, I, I know that it's true that I, that I am representing a community uh, with this work and I want them to be proud of it. I, I, want, I want it to come out authentically and I know that the authenticity is more about me than it is about trying to capture everyone else's experiences, but I want people to see themselves accurately reflected in a way that feels real to them and so that's a really tough challenge and so you know some of the things that I'm some of the things that so it's my, my book is a biography and and so much of it is 
based on what Floyd Jessing describes as being important about his own life, right? Like what it, like there's a whole thing about him eating dal and rukti, not because it matters to me, but because Floyd Jessing loves talking about how much he eats dal and rukti. <laughs> so, so like that's, that's like, he's part of my audience, but also like there's so much of it that's informed by my own politics and my worldview. Like I wanted, I wanted to center his immigration story uh, because that's such an important part of my life uh, and my life experience. And, and I wanted to mention the, the racism that he dealt with because I deal with racism, right? So like, it's, it's this really interesting question of who's your audience because I don't want to be centering the white gaze, but I do. Like I want kids who are not Sikh or Punjabi or Desi or South Asian to see us and be like, oh, those are real people. Like that's, I mean, if I'm being honest, I wish the world wasn't that way, but like for the sake of my kids' safety, I, I do want them to see that, right? So like, that is part of my audience. I, I want Punjabi and Sikh and South Asian kids to see this book and be like, cool, I see that Fulkari or I see the word Danda and I'm like, that's, that's my people, right? So like, to me, it's like everybody at once and, and the real challenge is how do, you, how, do you, how do you walk that line so everyone feels like this is for them? even if it's, even it's for them in, in different ways. Right. Well, I mean, this summer we saw everyone reading all the books about racism and obviously Kid Lit came up. Um, and, you know, just in terms of like writing books about us, about our communities um, and using children's literature as a tool to fight some of not just racism in the US, but some of the um, some of the problems we have in the South Asian community around caste, around colorism, shadism, around um, you know, everything being so focused on, you know, the Punjabification of Bollywood and every, you know, really ignoring um, our our siblings in, in different parts of South India and Sri Lanka. Um, you know, have you how does your politics around South Asia um, and your racial politics inform your your writing? And do you see it? Do you see Kidlet as a tool of of you know anti racism? Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is the million dollar question for me. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean. I think I think people are lying if they're saying their own political sense of their own identity doesn't inform what they're doing in this world, whether it's writing children's literature, or walking on the street, right? Like, of course, who we are informs what we do. And I think for the four of us, at least, it seems like we're all on the same page about how being on the other side of marginalization um, makes us want to do better for, for our people. And, and like, that's that's true for me. Um, in terms of the particularity of, of my, my brand of South Asian identity, um, it doesn't figure so much into this book in terms of a broader, uh, Desi identity, right? Like it's, it's very specific to Floyd Justing's experience as a Punjabi Sikh, um, and that's how it shows up in this book. But, but part of that is really trying to capture some of the diversity within the Punjabi Sikh community so that people don't see him or us and be like, oh, they're like, they're all the same, right? So it's so like really trying to dig into that a little bit. Uh, but, the, but the second part of your question that I'm most excited about is anti-racism. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's behind everything I'm trying to do in my life and, and through this book. And so um, what, what do these stories do and how can we use these stories to undercut these dehumanizing assumptions and stereotypes? I mean, that's, I think that's what all of us are about. I, I, that's, I think that's why I admire you all so much. So thanks for asking that question. And now tell me all your answers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my book was uh, unique in the fact that, you know, with it centering a specific religion, I had the, the beauty and the, the bandwidth to really focus on, you know, women of all ethnic and racial backgrounds. And I think that's, that was really important to me that I didn't overrepresent anyone from, you know, any place. There are several women that are mostly of, you know, American roots, but, um, you know, in terms of where they were from originally or their parents, grandparents, ancestors, um, it's from across the world. And I think that really you know, wanted to show to the fact that, you know, that is definitely a, a barrier in the systems that we've created as a society, um, but it is not, um, 
it is not something that cannot be overcome. Um, and it's not the responsibility of that individual to overcome it, but it, it is possible. Um, so I, I did, you know, make that a conscious effort um, to show women of all backgrounds and also to, to highlight, you know, Ilyasa Shabazz, Malcolm X's daughter, and how she's continuing to, you know, um, work on, you know, bridging these, these racial gaps. And so that's really the way that I kind of um, implemented, you know, anti-racism in, into my book. Amazing. You know, for me, a big part of, um the messaging or that kind of feeling of making a statement was um, having Nabi as my, as the illustrator for Lakshmi. Nabi is Tamil, um, transgender. He converted from Hinduism to Shia Islam. If you follow him on um, Instagram and Twitter, he has the most beautiful uh, illustration, like religious illustrations you'll ever see. Um, and a lot of the things that he put into the illustrations are things I completely agree with, but they were just these wonderful surprises. Like um, there's a, a scene in a bathroom and it's an all gender restroom. Um, and so it's just like this future we can dream of or that we're fighting for in our school systems. Um, I, you know, I did, the, I, I'm really big on showing the dad, you know, kind of countering the narratives in, in South, South Asian society about mommy making the roti, like, Papa's making the roti in Lakshmi, you know? Um, and so I think there are these like subtle things where we get to kind of put, put ourselves in and, and kind of create the worlds that we want to create for our kids and for, for the future. So um, speaking of illustrations, I would love to turn it over to Vashti. This is always my favorite part of working or seeing Vashti present, um, <laughs> see a little bit but learn a little bit from her on, on illustrating. Yeah, I'm definitely happy to talk a little bit about this because um, something you said um, really, really resonated with me, Shelley, in that like um, your illust the illustrator on Lakshmi's Mooch, Navi, um, they were able to like put in these small details um, and what, like, what I think of immediately is the fact that when I'm illustrating, like there's no, copy paste there's no like fill screen with um background junk like you as the illustrator have to choose every single thing that goes on the page and because you have to spend such time with that it's going to be your job to decide what, what outfit is that person wearing okay and so what style of outfit what does that mean what is the choice i what is the choice I make right here going to mean for the overall story? And so when you're thinking from this anti-racist standpoint, you can really put in those details. You can make those choices that are, you know, they're subtle, maybe no one will notice them, but they help kind of bring together or build this world that feels, you know, um, optimistic and exciting. And, and to me, that's what's really great about creating illustrations. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit of a, the background on how I would do an illustration for, for this book, Festival of Colors. So um, the inspiration is Holi, the Indian Festival of Colors, which celebrates the beginning of spring and new beginnings. So here's a photograph. I just Googled that. Um, what I really was looking for was like, how does the smoke or how, does the, how do the colors interact with people? I want to make sure that I'm showing faces so that kids can kind of look through and point out the characters that we already know and also find new people. Um, you don't wanna cover everybody up because otherwise it would just be colors. <laughs> that, that's not gonna be the most helpful, but I also need to fit in the text. So uh, this is the part I always have a hard time with is I have to make room on the page for the words. I always forget about that. So the text goes, poof, poof, poof. Soon the whole village is awash in color. So I make a list of the things that I need to include. That's the powder, the colored powder, um, the village, um, the people, and a crowd. Okay, seems simple enough. So I drew this sketch, okay? Um, I heard from the authors that um, they would like to include some animals. Um, and also they were interested in adding um, some kind of um, Easter eggs from their other books. So uh, here it is, poof, poof, poof. Soon the whole village is awash in color and they're shouting, holy high, holy high, holy high. 
Um, and I thought, okay, well, good. We can see some people. We can see a lot of colors. We can see the village in the background. And um, the art directors were like, that's great. Cool, cool, cool. Can we back up a little bit? Because we want to see more people. And I was like, okay, cool. So I backed up a little bit. Um, we heard that I uh, heard from the authors that they wanted to include a tuk tuk, which is this little vehicle on the right corner, um, as kind of an Easter egg in reference to their uh, other book, The Wheels and the Tuk Tuk. And they wanted to include some animals. So we've got a peacock now, we've got a wider shot of this elephant, and we've got more people and more village. And I was like, they're gonna love it. It's great. <laughs> I did the whole thing. And they were like, this is good. Um, can you, can we back up a little bit more? And I was like, oh, okay. So I was like, I, I need to include more people. Okay. So this is an example of like, you know, I don't, there's not just some magic brush that creates new people. I have to decide who these people are. And so I'm thinking about who's going to be out celebrating. How can I make some choices here to showcase diversity, diversity in size and body shape and age and in ethnicity, because, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, everyone gets to celebrate new beginnings. So even though we're celebrating in a specific place, um, I want to make sure that everyone is welcome. And so I was like, okay, they're going to love this. It's wide. We got the whole town. We can see all these people singing and dancing and playing music and having fun. And they're like, cool, cool, cool. Um, let's move to color. And we want to see more. <laughs> oh my goodness. So uh, I backed up a little bit more, added more people, added um, some uh, decorations in the background. And then I went into color and I was like, they're going to love this, right? <laughs> Um, I put these buildings in there uh, and they were like, you know, there's no room for the text. And I was like, oh no, I forgot about the text again. Um, so I had to remove the buildings and I added more people and more people in the background. Um, and I added color. So I think this, this must be close to the final. Um, yeah, so that was the final and here. I've zoomed in so we can see some of the things and some of the tidbits. And so, you know, like if you look at each of these faces, none of them are the same. You know, none of them are like, you know, entirely detailed. But what I'm trying to provide is an impression of this celebration that's for everyone. And so we've got auntie over here. We've got cousins. We've got neighbors. Um, we've got the animals. And like the thing that I was really trying to capture is that feeling of like when someone grabs a pile, like a handful of this holy powder and like smushes it in your face and you got it in your ear and you're like, Ugh. like I want that feeling on the page. And that can only come from like experiencing it, trying it out yourself. So that's what I was trying to recreate is this really visceral um, feeling of having experienced this celebration. Um, just so that like, other people will be excited about it and interested in it. Um, so I wanted to show one more example. So um, this is my book, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World. I wanted to make sure that I was showcasing um, people that, um, that use creativity in many different ways. So I'll just show a few examples. You know, here we have, um, a scientist, a writer, and a journalist. And, and to me, that is a really great cross-section of, of different ways you can use creativity. Um, and that book was really just about making sure um, we understood that ideas can come from anywhere. And I, one of my goals with the, this book in particular was to make sure that kids who think of themselves as creative, the kids who like to ask questions, the kids who like to take stuff apart and put it back together, got to see a little bit of themselves in any one of these people. So I drew them all in the same way. I imagine that they're little kids dressing up as these famous people. Um, so I created this little um, coloring sheet that anyone can fill out. And so, you know, the, the important thing here was when I, you know, growing up, um, my experience was predominantly, was really dominated by, um, I would say that I, my experience growing up was predominantly African-American. I think that that's the way I present to the world and that's the experience that I grew up with in growing up in the South in Virginia. Um, 
And so that first book that I wrote, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History, um, really celebrated that. But this second book, I really wanted to showcase those other sides of me and the other parts of my culture. And I wanted to make sure that even if you didn't see yourself in these books, um, that you would be able to create one for yourself. So usually I tell people, you can print this coloring page out and color it yourself. Or if you're feeling very crafty, um, I'm gonna show you how to draw um, one of the characters, the little dreamer. Um, so I'm gonna open up my drawing app and do a little drawing for you guys, okay? So hello. This is my like general demo. I hope that's okay. Um, I think this is always, this is my favorite part just because I really like drawing people. I really like um, showing people how to do this because I think so many possibilities are open when you can create, um, when you can create for yourself um, and you can create an image of yourself or someone who inspires you. Um, so I always start off with kind of a very loose, sketchy circle. I draw like this. I put down a thousand lines and make it really messy. Um, and if I'm really feeling like I want to clean it up later, like I might do this part in pencil and then go over top of it in a dark marker and outline my favorite lines here. And then I would erase the mess. But I'm going to keep the mess today because I think that helps make it feel authentic. Okay, so I do everything else with the letter C. I'm gonna take that shape and I'm gonna roll it down onto its side and I'm gonna make some eyes. I do two like this to make eyes and I flip that shape upside down to make some eyebrows. I put a nice small one in the center and then I flip it one more time to make a nice smile. So that's the general base for the little leader character. You can take this and turn it into anyone. So um, I could draw um, one of the characters from Festival of Colors. Um, they're Chintu and Mintu, brother and sister. I think, I think I remember how to draw the hair. Now, I always draw the eyes closed because I like to imagine that these are little kids closing their eyes, imagining themselves as these wonderful people. They're putting on the costume and they're just kind of living in that moment. But if you're feeling like, oh, I want to open the eyes, you could do that. like really short on the sides and really curly up top. So um, I did, I took a couple photos of him and used him for inspiration. Um, and then you can keep going, you could add clothes, you could add whatever you want. So I think um, Nintu has these little, this little outfit on. There you go. Now I could add all the colors that I wanted for my Let's say they've got, <laughs> they've got some uh, holy powder on them. And I think I'm gonna leave it there because now you've got all the building blocks to draw the character that you wanna draw. I hope that's helpful. I hope that was an interesting kind of sneak peek behind the scenes on creating a book. Honestly, a lot of um, doing this stuff is just making a lot of mistakes, sketching out a lot of things um, and seeing what works guys are interested in working on books, I highly recommend taking your pencils out, um, drawing with whatever you can find, and making a lot of mistakes and um, being comfortable with that. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I mean, I'm really, I'm a big fan of making art with whatever tools you have, and um, because of the pandemic, I couldn't go to the art supply store, so I started making characters with paper bags, with old um, wrapping paper, so I think um, if there are any creative folks watching, definitely feel empowered by that, knowing that 
there's art all around you. This has been such a wonderful chat and um, experience watching you do your art and um, me reading from Lakshmi for the first time. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed um, speaking with all of you and I know we could probably keep going and we should keep going at some point. And I just want to thank um, Aditya and the South Asian Avant-Garde for hosting us and um, just really grateful to be in community with all of you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs>